to First Baptist Church of Cedar Key. If you're a guest of ours, we're thankful that you're with us this morning. Hopefully everybody on the way in, you were able to grab a worship guide that'll be helpful for you throughout the service. Also, yes, we do have a guest information packet, which can tell you a little bit more about who we are as a church and what we believe, so make sure you grab one of those from outside. Also want to point out that we have entered into, or about to enter into, Advent season. Advent means the coming or arriving, and so during this season, really starting December 1st, uh, we start to look at the, the coming of Jesus, His first coming, look back at His first coming to prepare us for Christmas as we look forward to His second coming. And so out front, there are a few different devotionals. You can pick those up. Those are free to you. And you can go through these. And these are just uh, Advent readings throughout the month of December. There's one each day. You can use it as, in addition to your kind of Bible reading for your quiet time. Or use it if you have a family or friends you want to get together and read that together. You can do that. And it's helpful for you. And a lot of the church will be going through that together. Inside your worship guide, we have a few things for you. There's a few tear-outs. Uh, one of those is a guest information form, so if you want to fill that out for us, let us know who you are and how we can be praying for you. You can drop that in one of the boxes that are by the doors before you leave today. There's also another one that just is for prayer requests. That's for anyone to fill out, and if you can note on there if you want the elders only of the church praying for your request, or if you want the whole church praying, we send out prayer updates throughout the week, and so you can note that on there, and again, drop those in the boxes before you go. A few other, other announcements we have, a biblical counseling class today at uh, 2 p.m., and so you'll get, you guys will be meeting over in the fellowship hall, so those who are continuing that, today at 2 p.m. Of course, we have uh, Thanksgiving coming up, and so we will have, um, we'll have a Wednesday evening service, but it's just going to be a time to get together and just honestly boast in the Lord's goodness and what are we thankful for. So if you want to, many of you will be traveling or preparing meals and things, but anyone who wants to come, we'll just have a time together of just prayer and thanking the Lord for His goodness and all He's done for us. Uh, save the date on here, December 14th, uh, 12 to 4 p.m. We're going to have a church picnic. This is going to be at Ian and Hannah's house. Hamburgers, hot dogs, chips will be provided. We will have a dessert tasting contest. <laughs> so bring your favorite dessert to share. Is there is there a prize for winning? The... Okay. All right. Is there a prize? Same. You don't want to lose. Okay. Okay. Uh, a couple other dates for you. On December 5th and 6th, we're hosting our uh, Anchored in Christ conference. Uh, we have about 45 people signed up for that so far. So we have uh, people from really all around the state that will be coming, even some uh, coming from Georgia, to come down for our conference. So if you're able to attend, you can go online and sign up for that. If you just want to be around and help out, you can do that as well. But if you can't attend or help, then just please be praying for uh, the conference that the Lord would bless it. Uh, there are some cards that are on the edges of the pews, and do we have instructions for those? Uh, so we are pretty well set on our missionary boxes as far as like um, things to send them, Christmas candy, and so on and so forth. But we need cards. We need love, prayers, whatever you can put in the card to send to them so that they know you love them or praying for them, um, and that we're walking through this holiday season with them. Yeah, for those of you who've never uh, maybe served overseas in uh, any type of context, uh, it, it definitely gets lonely during the holidays. You, you miss your family, you miss uh, you, even your, your culture and the things that your culture does, you miss your church. And so coming alongside the missionaries during this time is important. Uh, it's good to do it all the time, but especially during this season. So those cards, if you see them on the edge, edge of the pews, just grab those and you can uh, fill them out. How, when do they need to have them back by? Next Sunday. If my sermon gets extremely boring, just go ahead and start doing them while you're in here. I'll think you're taking notes, and so I'll be like really proud of you. But at least have them back by next Sunday. Yeah. All right. Uh, one thing I need to uh, do is I'm going to have our re yes. Quick question: How many boxes did you end up? Uh, three. We're only only able to send three. One missionary did get back to me, the Mason Greens, and then um, the Greers. Don't actually have an address to receive mail at, from what he said. So we're doing three. Okay. Yeah, one thing before the readers come forward, uh, I need Mr. Ian to come forward, please. And Ms. Hannah, if you could just stand up and come over there real quick. Last Sunday we were able to. <laughs> throw your kid down? No, he's so Oh. Silas, you can come too. <laughs> Oh, 
Uh, last, last Sunday, uh, we had our kind of elders or pastors appreciation month, and then, of course, I've deemed it also uh, November deacons appreciation month. And so you guys, uh, you were traveling, I think, last week or something was going on, so we wanted to give you these things here and just say that we appreciate your service to the church, and, of course, you guys serving together all the time. So we just praise God for you guys. And, you know, And while we're doing that, uh, Miss Rosie, if you just come forward real quick. I know, I got you anyway. Uh, we're excited. I'm just going to give Miss Rosie this, Rosie Springer here. Uh, our church is able to vote on her adding to, uh, being added to our membership at our last members meeting. 100% yes vote. There was one that said no, but we didn't count his vote because he's a bonehead and not a guest. We're still saying 100% yes, so thank you. Thank you. Welcome, Yay. sister. Normally we do that at the end of the service, but now that she's a member, she's already serving in the nursery, so she'll be gone <laughs> during the service. So. All right, if I can have uh, Jeff and Jared come forward. Uh, Jeff's going to be uh, reading out of the Old Testament for you. Jared's going to be reading out of the New Testament and then praying for our service as we transition to the service now. So if you're able and willing, please stand in honor of God's Word being read publicly. Good morning. I'll be reading out of Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Titus 3, 1 through 7, be ready for every good work. Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and be hated by others, and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by His grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for bringing us here today. Uh, thank you for the freedom that we have in this country to worship you freely. Uh, I thank you for everyone here. I pray for anyone here that does not know the goodness of, of your mercy and your grace, uh, that they would just um, feel you today, that you'd reach into their hearts, and um, that we would welcome them as a congregation. I uh, pray for Billy as he brings the word. I pray for uh, our worship team as they lead us in worship. And uh, Father, I just pray that all, all of this would bring you glory today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Let's begin singing this morning with Have Faith in God. Let's sing.
morning, I only have two verses out of Romans 5 to read to you. I was scanning over it. Really, we ought to read the whole thing, but it's long. Um, and it talks about God's mercy and God's grace. We're going to sing about the mercy portion in the second set. But I want to read verses 20 and 21. He says, out of Romans 5, he says, Now the law came in to increase the trespass. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that, as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I love that verse, that passage. And I encourage you to go back and read Romans 5 sometime if you want to look at peace that we have with God and God's grace and God's mercy. It's a great chapter for that. Let's sing together a grace that's greater than all of our sins. This morning we're going to, for our scripture reading, is going to be found out of uh, Psalm 122, a psalm of ascent. I'm going to read the first four verses. It says, I rejoice with those who said to me, Let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet were standing within your gates, Jerusalem. Jerusalem, built as a city should be, solidly united, where the tribes, the Lord's tribes, go up and give thanks to the name of the Lord. We've got a lot to be thankful for and a lot to pray for. One of the things we like to do as a church is uh, any of our visitors that would like to mention the name of their home church, we like to uh, always pray for you and your uh, church. So do we have any visitors this morning that would 
would like to share with us the name of their church. <coughs> <coughs> Looks like all home folks today. That's a good thing. On the screen you'll see we pray for a lot of churches throughout the region. Grace Christian Church, uh, Cornerstone Church. There's several be scrolling across uh, the screen there. We pray for these churches every week. Uh, some are local, some are international. And we always want to pray for our missionaries uh, around the world. Ones we pray for here, but all, all missionaries because they're, they're, they're doing a very tough job. And uh, always want to be mindful of that. And we have an unreached people group on the screen. Uh, I'll see if I can get this Mandian in Australia. Uh, always want to be praying for all unreached. But this is our group. And we don't just pray for this group today. We pray for this, these groups throughout the week. And as we go to the Lord in prayer, we always want to pray for the unreached and for the gospel to go forward. So what we do during our prayer time is we like to pray silently as uh, Pastor Billy mentioned, Mr. Ed, and anybody uh, who's sick or suffering, or we have a lot of people traveling, we'll pray silently for those, and after we've done that for a few moments, then I'll close us. Let's pray silently. Precious Heavenly Father, God, we thank You for this day You've given us, Lord. We thank You for this opportunity to be in Your house, Lord, to praise and worship You, Lord. Lord, we lift up the missionaries around the world, Lord. We pray that You be with them, Lord, during this time of difficulty, when the holidays and things, when they're away from families, Lord. Uh, we just pray that You would give them the strength to continue, Lord, to reach the unreached with the good news of the Gospel, Lord. Lord, we pray that the Gospel would go forward in our community, Lord. Lord, we lift up those who are dealing with sickness and suffering, Lord, especially now Mr. Ed. Lord, we pray that you be with him, be with Miss Dee as well, Lord. Be with Miss Nancy Henry with the loss of her daughter, Lord, and we just pray for peace and comfort. And Lord, we just pray for all those who are uh, sick and suffering, Lord, and those who have, may have lost a loved one, Lord. We just pray that you would give them comfort, Lord, help them to suffer well through this. Lord, we... Uh, Pray for those who are traveling, and Lord, we just pray for uh, safe travels for them. God, we uh, thank you for this time that we can gather together and praise and worship you. We pray that it would be glorifying and honoring you, Lord. We now ask that you remove distractions, help us to be focused on you, Lord. Be with Pastor Billy as he brings the message. Lord, we just pray that you would give us ears to hear and Lord, feet to apply it and apply it to our lives, Lord, and take what we hear from here, Lord, to our community so that we can be lights in this community. For you. God, we love you more than anything because you first loved us and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with us as we continue to sing? <laughs>
dropping off little ones, uh, go ahead and drop these doors around to the right. And up the stairs, there should be some close waiting for you up there. Let me invite you to take your copy of God's holy, inerrant, inspired, and living word and turn to 2 Samuel chapter 24. 2 Samuel chapter 24. If you do not have a Bible with you today, there should be some pew Bibles in front of you or near you. It should be around page 277 in the pew Bibles, 2 Samuel chapter 24. As you're turning to 2 Samuel chapter 24, uh, let me ask you a question you don't have to answer out loud, of course, but have you ever had a a relationship with someone that you were really close to, somebody you trusted, somebody that was really your your, your best friend, perhaps, and then that person turned on you? You ever have somebody who was really with you and for you, and you thought that was going to be my lifelong friend? with me all the days of my life or their life and and then things changed then they became somebody that maybe you didn't talk to quite as often and then maybe it moved to her that they're actually an enemy to where now there's this this big issue with that person unfortunately most of us have had a scenario like this in our lives maybe more than one And I can think about my own life and sometimes how those situations have happened, and I can certainly be sad about that and wish that uh, at times it it was different, but I can also say this, that when you do find the true friend that stays with you, it makes it that much more sweeter because you know what it's like to get burned. You know what it's like to be let down. You know what it's like to be hurt. And so when you have that other person, oh man just shows you how remarkable that is. And so even though that was, at least in my life, very difficult at different times, I wouldn't trade it. I wouldn't trade it because of what comes out of it. As we're wrapping up 2 Samuel chapter 24, there's going to be some ideas here that are a little challenging, actually. If you have read this week, uh, read ahead at all, you know that we might have some challenging conversations today about this text. If you haven't been with us, what we like to do is walk through books of the Bible verse by verse, chapter by chapter, to understand the, the passage in its context, to know the, the biblical historical context, and then the, the kind of the, the genre and the literary context. That way we can understand its meaning and then thus apply it to our lives by the Holy Spirit. For those who've been here, we've been going through 2 Samuel for a while, while before that we were in Philippians for a short time, but we also went through 1 Samuel, and as I told you before, 1 and 2 Samuel really are just one book together. We've separated those in the English, but in Hebrew it's just one book, but you guys couldn't handle going that long without a little bit of a break. And as we're coming to the end of 1 and 2 Samuel together, We're going to see how this thing ends. It's actually not going to be the end of David's life, but the end of what the author of 2 Samuel wanted us to see. I told you guys before that these last few chapters of 2 Samuel are not chronological with the rest of the book. It's more of a literary tool that the author has done. Chapter 21, it had a topic, which was kind of Saul's sin, by breaking a covenant, and then David came and made it right. After that, it talked about the the mighty men who killed the four giants, the four other giants other than Goliath, and we we talked about how that was kind of the next section. And I was explaining what chiasm is, how it's kind of things that start out, this mirrors this, and then it gets closer, this mirrors this, then you get here, this mirrors this. 
The middle part of it was David's long song or prayer that we covered together. And then just after that, kind of mirroring that, was David's last words. And we talked about what would our last words be? What do we hope our last words will be? And then last week we covered more about David's mighty men. And this week we'll cover that last section where instead of Saul being the one who sins and then David coming and taking care of that, it's David who's going to sin again. Those of you been going through, some of you had a really high view of David when we started this whole thing. You're excited to see how great David was, and you started to go throughout this thing, oh man, I'm not so sure he's so great after all. Hopefully we didn't get to where we were kind of judgy on David, though, because all that really shows us is that we're just like David. We have ups, we have downs, but God remains faithful. And the wonderful thing about David's life is that even when he would fail, and we saw him fail multiple times, he would always repent. A lot of people want to look at the Christian life and say, well, how do you know that you're a Christian? How do you know that you're saved? Some people say, well, I was baptized when I was six or seven or 20 or 30. That's how I know I was saved. Some people say, well, I walked down the aisle at my church. That's how I know I was saved. Some people say, well, I go to church. Like 50 out of 52 Sundays, that's got to count for something. The truth of the matter is, in the Bible, the exhortation to those is look at your life. And when you sin, does the Holy Spirit convict you? And do you repent and keep following? That idea sometimes of once saved, always saved, that can get us into a a mindset that, well, once I said a prayer, I'm good. I think it's Pastor J.D. Greer, but once saved, forever following. Forever following doesn't mean you don't fall, but do you get back up? And I love that about David. I love that about David. And we're going to see the same thing. The book's going to end with the same thing happening, which shouldn't surprise us. Some of you remember, uh, as we were finishing up the sermon last week, we were going through all these mighty men that David had. And in verse 39 of chapter 23, Uriah the Hittite was mentioned, the last one mentioned. For those who've been following along, we were kind of like, ooh, that was a bit of a surprise. All these great warriors, these great things, and then Uriah is brought up again. It's kind of like that, that scenario in your life where you've had that that low season, and you get around other people, and all they want to talk about is your low season. You ever have that? Or you have that kind of down point, like, oh yeah, you remember when 15 years ago you did that? And you're like, oh man, it's always great to hang out with you. <laughs> Thanks for bringing it up again. It's kind of how it felt, like, all right, David's doing well, look at all these mighty men, this and that, and then Uriah is brought up again. Showing us again that David isn't the king we're looking for. He's not perfect. We're looking from the one that's going to come from his line, who is perfect. Of course, David committed adultery with Uriah's wife, and that's why that's mentioned. But what that also does is textually, it gives us a little bit of a hint that, guess what, more more difficulties are coming in chapter 24. Follow along with me as I begin to read the text, and we'll work through it and see what the Lord has for us today. 2 Samuel chapter 24, beginning verse 1. Again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. Oh boy, here we go again. The Lord is angry with Israel. Part of the question you go right away is, well, why? Why is the Lord angry with Israel here? And guess what? The text does not tell us. The again part probably links back to chapter 21, when the Lord was angry with all of Israel because of what Saul did, maybe. But we don't know why he is angry. His anger is kindled against Israel. Now watch what happens. So he's he's upset with them. So look what he does. Look what the Lord does. Look, 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 look. And he incited David against them, saying, Go, number Israel and Judah. The Lord's angry with them. He's angry with Israel over something. We don't know what they did. And so the Lord incited David against them by saying, Go and number them. Go and count. 
Well, that doesn't seem like a really bad thing, right? If you're really upset with somebody, you know what? I'm mad at Joni. Justin, I want you to go count people. (laughs) Lord, what? I don't understand. There's times in the Pentateuch, in the first five books, where the Lord commands that the people be counted. Don't know why this is bad, but let's continue to read. So the king said to Joab, you guys remember Joab, the general? He's been all around. Sometimes he's good, sometimes he's bad. I don't know. The commander of the army, his general here. He's back in his position here. Who was with him? Go through all the tribes of Israel from Dan to Beersheba and number the people that I may know the number of the people. But Joab said to the king, May the Lord your God add to the people a hundred times as many as there are while the eyes of my lord the king still see. But why does my lord the king delight in this thing? He says, Joab, go ahead, go go across the whole land and number everybody. And Joab's like, ugh. King, I I hope that, that, man, many, many more come under your reign, and we have more and more people, but why do you want me to do this? Why do you you want this done? Kind of strange, Joab. what, What are you getting at here? But the king's word, verse 4, prevailed against Joab and the commanders of the army. So Joab and the commanders of the army went out from the presence of the king to number the people of Israel. They crossed the Jordan and began from Aroer and from the city that is in the middle of the valley toward Gad and on to Jazer. Then they came to Gilead and to Kadesh and in the land of the Hittites. And they came to Dan and from Dan they went around to Sidon and came to the fortress of Tyre and to all the cities of the Hivites and the Canaanites. And they went out to the Negev of Judah at Beersheba. So when they had gone through all the land, they came to Jerusalem at the end of nine months and 20 days. We see that they went everywhere. As it's named in those places, if you were to map, you'd see how they kind of made their way around. They got everywhere, and they were numbering as they were supposed to do. Nine months, 20 days, and Joab gave the sum of the numbering of the people to the king. In Israel, there were... 800,000 valiant men who drew the sword, and the men of Judah were 500,000. Doesn't seem like much of a a punishment. Not a big deal. The Lord was upset with Israel, so he incites David. David, go and and count people. We've even had counting done before. Doesn't make much sense until you get to verse 10. Look what happens, guys. But David's heart struck him. After he had numbered the people. You see what he, after he numbers the people, now he has some type of issue in his own heart, his conscience here. And David said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I have done. But now, O Lord, please take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have done very foolishly. What did he do wrong? Somebody tell me. What did he do? What's he saying that he did wrong? Y'all are so scared. <laughs> Come on, what does it say? He counted. He numbered the people. Who incited him to do that? God did. God's angry with Israel. God incites David to count. David counts. Joab says, hey, should you really count? He still counts. And as soon as he's done, he has conviction. He's done something wrong. And he has sinned greatly against God. Anyone seen a little bit of a challenge here? If God incited David to do that, and that ended up being sin for David, well, that kind of seems like God might be involved in David's sin. There's something called a theodicy. A theodicy. What that is, the first word coming from theos, which is God, and dk, which is justice. And in theology, you go through and you try to come up with a theodicy which explains God's justice. It's actually how you answer, or you try to, answer the question, if there's evil in the world, is there evil in the world? If there's evil in the world, but God is sovereign, in control, and good, then why doesn't he just take care of it all? Why did he ever even allow evil to exist? Why doesn't he just get rid of it? 
Maybe he's not smart enough. Does he not know what's going on? Oh, wait. According to Scripture, God knows everything and knew it before he created anything. He doesn't learn a thing. He knows it all right now. So it can't be that he didn't know. Maybe he knows, mm, but he's just not powerful enough to do anything about it. Does that seem like something the Scriptures would teach us? That's not it either. Well, if he, if he knows it and he's powerful enough, maybe he's just not good. Maybe he's not good. Is that what the scriptures tell us? No. Couldn't he have stopped Satan? Who made Satan? Who made you? Is Satan evil? Are you? You see the difficulty? A little bit of tension here. What makes it even more interesting is, keep your finger here, flip over to First Chronicles chapter 21. Just, some of you are like, where? Just go to the right a little bit. Chronicles, First Chronicles chapter 21. The book of Chronicles gives a bunch of details about the history of Israel as well, and you see a lot about David's life there as well. First Chronicles chapter 21, talking about this same instance, the census. Listen to what this says. First Chronicles chapter 21, beginning in verse 1. Then Satan stood against Israel and incited David to number Israel. So David said to Joab and to the commanders of the army, Go number Israel from Beersheba to Dan and bring me a report that I may know their number. It goes on to talk about the same thing. Um, problem. Who's doing the inciting in, in First Chronicles? Who's doing the inciting in 2 Samuel? Is anyone uncomfortable yet? Satan is bad. Sin is bad. Death is bad. And what's interesting is because the Lord has ordained this universe, this world, our lives, even what is bad he uses for good. Does anyone remember that in Joseph's story? When his brothers had turned on him and sold him into slavery and the Lord worked and raised him up and there were some bad things happening there and the Lord was in control of all of it. He's over every bit of it. And what's interesting is the Lord uses that. Their actual moral choices that are evil that the Lord has basically in consideration and in working with to bring out the good. <coughs> I told you a few moments ago that uh, I, I'm thankful for the bad relationships because they show me the good. You know how you know what hot water is? Because you know what cold water is. You know how you know what light is? Because you know what dark is. If I were to ask you this, what's your favorite attribute about God? Right? If I, you don't have to answer, but if you're thinking about it, and you were thinking about, man, when I, when I hear or think about this part of how God is, my heart just bursts with worship. For some of you, you might say, oh, it's, when I think about how powerful God is, man, I just burst in worship. Maybe you would say that. Maybe for some of you, you, you would say, oh, man, when, when I think about the fact that God knows everything, man, I just burst out in worship. I just love that. Maybe. For some of you, and I would argue maybe most of you, I think you're more like me. When I think about the love and the mercy and the graciousness of God, I can't help but praise Him. Here's the challenging part. If there's no sin, if there's no Satan, if there's no death, if there's no pain, if there's none of that, those attributes of God his graciousness, his mercy, and his love are things that we would never know about him. It's only in the backdrop of that that we see the glory of our Lord and more of his character. And so even though Satan is involved and he's evil and we're evil, all under God's hidden will, he is working in such a way that it doesn't change the fact that he's good. 
and that we make moral decisions that are sin. Somehow he's able to work all that together to show us his glory. And I think what you see is the writer of Chronicles is telling us how did that happen with David? How did ultimately the, the Lord move David and he was, ended up being tempted, but the Lord himself will not tempt, does, right? James tells us he cannot be tempted and he will not tempt. But the devil does come and incites David. And David responds with being tempted in sin. Martin Luther talks about the devil. You know what he says? It's interesting. He says, yeah, he's the devil. He's even God's devil. What does that mean? It means he's a pawn. Some of us have an idea that like Satan is up there with Jesus. And I'll tell you what, if any of you ever share that stupid meme on Facebook where Jesus and Satan are arm wrestling, I'm going to slap you. <laughs> are you kidding me? You think that's how it goes? Jesus, all powerful, who holds all things together, is arm wrestling Satan? No, no, no. Think about the book of Job. What does Job have to do, or what does Satan have to do, rather, if he wants to go and test Job? What does he have to do? He has to go to God and ask permission. He's even God's devil. God, even when you're being tempted, God will allow it to a point and he'll stop it. You're suffering, God will allow it to a point and then he stops it. He's in control of everything, which should give you great rest. As long as you remember, he knows everything. He's all powerful and he's all good. A lot of times when things happen, we want to put God on trial. Who are we? Were we there when the mountains were formed? Were we there when everything was created? No, we weren't. We need eyes of faith to help us. What's going on here is remarkable. The Lord is angry against Israel for what they've done. He's going to bring his wrath, his judgment upon them again. He's going to do it by allowing Satan to come and tempt David, who's going to freely choose to sin, but he does something that seems to be okay. He counts, but there's something wrong, apparently, with it. What does he do when he counts? That's the problem. We don't know exactly, but I can give you a, a few things that it might be. See, when you did take a count in the Old Testament, when you were to go number everybody, you also were supposed to do sacrifices. Maybe that wasn't done. Or maybe... Even worse, when David wants the count, it's because he wants to see how great of a king he is. Or maybe even worse, when he wants the count, it's because he's a little bit worried that his enemies may overtake him. And instead of putting his faith that God will do what God said he would do, he's starting to worry. So he says, how many troops do we have? Just in case. What if they come? And God, throughout First and Second Samuel, has been so faithful to David, and he begins to doubt our faithlessness coming out. Could have been those, could have been something else. But something in there, David realizes when he goes for the count, oh man, I have sinned against the Lord. Now, that's kind of talking about what we see, this kind of tension. That's not the point of the text, guys. I'm just answering that because if you read through and then you read Chronicles, you're going to go, what in the world is going on? I just want to do that as a little bit of a side note to let you know that that is not the point of the text. It's tied to the point of the text, but it's not the point. Read with me. It's not the point. Watch. David says he's done foolishly. So verse 11, and when David arose in the morning, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Gad, David's seer, saying, Go and say to David, thus says the Lord, three things I offer you, choose one of them that I may do it to you. Oh man, David realized he sinned and then God's word comes to him here, right? His, his prophet's coming to speak to him. Here's, here's David's choices. How, how would you guys like this choice? How, check this out. Verse 13, so Gad came to David and told him and said to him, shall three years of famine come to you in your land or will you flee three months before your foes while they pursue you? Or shall there be three days of pestilence in your land? Now consider and decide what answer I shall return to him who sent me. There you go. Three years, three months, or three days? Look what David says. And David said to Gad, I am in great distress. 
let us fall into the hand of the Lord for his, what does it say? His mercy is great, but let me not fall into the hand of man. David's been there before. You've been following along his, his son, Absalom, Saul. He's like, I don't want to be in man's hands. I would rather be in the Lord's hands because he's merciful. David knows his God is a God of mercy. So he doesn't choose the second one. Verse 15 tells us which one he chooses here. So the Lord sent pestilence on Israel from morning until the appointed time. And there died of the people from Dan to Beersheba 70,000 men. It doesn't mean it was easy. The judgment was coming from the Lord still. And again, remember, it was also against Israel for their whatever they've done, their unbelief, whatever it was. And when the angel stretched out his hand towards Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord relented from the calamity and said to the angel who was working destruction among the people, it is enough. Now stay your hand. You see, this angel is this one going. Kind of reminds you of the angel of death a little bit if you're thinking about the book of Exodus. The Lord using his angels and he's going out and he's wiping out the people and it's moving towards Jerusalem, and the Lord says, stay your hand, that's enough. And guess what? That angel doesn't get to kill one more person than what the Lord permits. Because the Lord is in control. And the angel of the Lord was by the threshing floor of Aruna, the Jebusite. Then David spoke to the Lord when he saw the angel who was striking the people. Look at, look at David's response here. And said, Behold, I have sinned. He's saying it again. I've sinned. It's me. I have done wickedly. But these sheep, what have they done? Please let your hand be against me and against my father's house. See, David didn't know that the Lord was judging the whole nation because all David could think of was his own sin. Man, this is where he's being a good king again, right? He's like, Lord, it was my sin. Put it on me. Don't put, don't put it on the sheep. Put it on me. Verse 18, and Gad came that day to David and said to him, go up, raise an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite. So David went up to, at Gad's word, as the Lord commanded. They keep naming this place here, this, this threshing floor. And he says, you're going to go there. I'm, I'm stopping. I'm holding back my wrath. It's not appeased yet. Atonement hasn't been made. You've confessed it, and I'm holding back my wrath, but something still has to be done. Go and make an altar. You know what happens on altars? Sacrifices. I'll hold back my wrath, but you need to go to this particular location. There needs to be a sacrifice for there to be atonement. So David went up at Gad's word as the Lord commanded. And when Aruna looked down, he saw the king and his servants coming on toward him. This is a, a higher place. It's up on, a, up on a hill here. And Aruna went out and paid homage to the king with his face to the ground. And Aruna said, why has my lord the king come to his servant? David says, to buy the threshing floor from you in order to build an altar to the Lord that the plague may be averted from the people. And Aruna said to David, let my lord the king take and offer up what seems good to him. Here are the oxen for the burnt offering and the threshing sledges and the yokes of the oxen for the wood. All this, O king, Aruna gives to the king. And Aruna said to the king, May the Lord your God accept you. May your sacrifice, here, just, just take whatever you need, king, just, just do it. And may God accept your sacrifice. May he accept you. But the king said to Aruna, No. But I will buy it from you for a price. I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God that cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. Side note here, friends. You want to serve the Lord? You want to follow him? It's going to cost you something. And right now, if it's not costing you anything, your life looks exactly the same, that's a problem. It's a red flag. 
if I can look at your life and I can look at an unbeliever's life and the only difference is you show up maybe an hour or two during the week and that's pretty much it, you decide this is your hobby than something else, your life isn't costing anything to follow him, there's a problem. David gets that. He's like, uh, 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 uh. You're not, I'm not doing something this important. I'm not going to build an altar to the Lord when you're just going to give it to me. I'm paying for it because it, it costs something. And David built there an altar to the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. So the Lord responded to the plea for the land and the plague was averted from Israel. He held back his wrath until the altar was built, the sacrifice is done, and now the Lord removes his hand completely. God's wrath has been appeased. Atonement is done, and that's the end of 2 Samuel. David messed up again. God was faithful to David. David repented, and he sacrificed to the Lord. Under God's sovereign hand, we have seen David's life throughout this book. We've seen him be raised up, we've seen him on the run, we've seen him brought down low, and we've seen God be faithful to him over and over and over again. In the book of 2 Samuel, you can't help but see the goodness and faithfulness of God. You can't help but see that it is God who has to be the Savior over and over and over again. You see shadows of the true king when you watch David. There's times he does well and there's times he doesn't. But you see shadows of the king, the one that's coming, the one from 2 Samuel 7, the promised one. But what I love about how this thing ends is the location. It's, it was kind of getting specific over and over and over again about where this was going to happen, right? The angel's coming, coming towards Jerusalem. He's going to wipe everything out. People are dying. And the Lord says, stop right there. That's far enough. Now, David, go up there and build an altar. Why there? Number one, do you all know the story of Abraham and Isaac? Yeah, that's pretty much the location where that was. Abraham was going to kill his son. He was tested by the Lord to, to kill his son Isaac. The promise run, right? He's supposed to come from his line. He's going to bless all the nations. This is his only kid. How's that going to work? Abraham goes up on the hill to this location, and he's there. He's about to kill the animal or about to kill his son, and then the Lord says, whoa, whoa, stop, 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 stop. The Lord's going to provide the sacrifice. That's what he told his son. He looks over, says, right there, take that animal, sacrifice it. Pointing to that the Lord will provide the sacrifice that's needed for all of us. That same spot, now David's there. And David, he, God's wrath is coming, and David makes a sacrifice right there. And the Lord's wrath is appeased. When you go a little further, David just bought that land. Remember what David really wanted to do for the Lord? There was one thing David really wanted to do for the Lord. I want to build you a house. The Lord says, that's not for you to do. No, 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 someone else is going to get to build a house, but I'm going to build for you, David, a house, a line, someone who's going to come, and Solomon comes along, his son. You know what he gets to do? He gets to build the temple. You know where he builds the temple? Right there on the threshing floor. You know what the temple's for? It's where the sacrifices are done. It's where the sacrifices are done to hold back the wrath of God until the the great sacrifice would come. And we see Jesus come. We see Jesus live perfectly. We see Jesus die as a sacrifice on the cross. What happens inside the temple with the veil? It's torn. Jesus comes, all pointing to him. He dies. And now you know what he says? He's the temple. And we as believers, are bricks or in that temple that he's building, all going back and pointing to this. I love that that's the location. I love that it's tied together because the same theme is true. It is God who saves. We have our ups, 
We have our downs, but it's God who remains faithful to his word. And he's always good to us. I've been listening to a song this week. Some of you know the song, The Goodness of God. I believe this would be David's prayer at the end of his life. And it's ours too. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. Can that be our prayer? Can that be our lives? If you don't know him, you don't know how to sing that song yet. But you can know him today. You can trust in him today. Let's pray together. Father, we do thank you for your grace. We are thankful for your word. We're thankful for your truth. We're thankful for your mercy. Lord, it is your mercy, your love, your grace that makes us just cry out in worship to you. In fact, you say, Lord, that you show your love to us. The way you show your love to us is that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It's against that darkness that we see your glory and the glory of Christ. So I pray for those who are here, Lord, who do not know you. I pray they would come to know you today. And for the rest of us, may we sing the song that all of our lives you have been faithful and so, so good. May we look more like Jesus because he is perfect. In his name we pray. Amen. If Kevin can come forward and uh, help with the Lord's Supper. Brother Wayne, Brother Mike, you guys come up. We're going to prepare the Lord's Supper for you up here. And, and really that's coming right off of what we're talking about. The, the sacrifice, right? Jesus' sacrifice for us. His body, His blood. So that's why we do this every week. It's a, it's a way to, to see the gospel message. We hear about it, we sing about it, and we like to see it. And we, we do this because we that's what the New Testament teaches. Do this as often as we're together. Do this for remembrance of things. So take a few moments now, ask the Lord to search your heart and again. Where are you at? Are you hearing God's word and are you still following? If you are, that means you're repenting, which means that you're welcome to take the Lord's Supper with us. If you're here and you're not a follower of Jesus yet, talk with us afterwards. But the Lord's Supper is not for you. This is just something for you to observe. This is for people who are following Jesus, okay? To just observe for that best and have it. Take a moment and ask the Lord to search your heart while we prepare it up here. For I received from the Lord what I also I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This is the cup, the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you drink, eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim, proclaim the Lord's death until the come. We'll start in the wings and we'll do what we've been doing the last few weeks. We'll come forward, take the, the bread and the cup and go back to the seat and then we'll all take it together at the same time. Uh, if you're not able to come forward, uh, don't worry, we can bring it to you after everybody else is gone. Likewise, if you need a, a gluten-free option, just let us know when you come up and we need that too, okay? We'll start over here in the wings and we'll just Feel free to read scripture over the congregation while you're waiting your turn.
Jesus, when he was on that night, when he was betrayed, he said, take me, so take his body and eat to do Likewise, when he had the cup, he said, take and drink this day. And to that, all God's people say, Amen. Let's stand and sing together. Sing the chorus of his mercy and chorus. <laughs> Praise the Lord, his mercy is more. Thank you for being here uh, this morning. Again, if you have your guest information forms or prayer requests or feel like to give, you can drop those in the boxes or go online to give. There's also the book area with some new study Bibles and things over here. Those are free to you, so please go over there. And don't forget your Advent devotionals. Brother Doug is gone today, so I'm going to read a blessing over you before you go. Out of the book of Jude, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, and now and forever. Amen. Amen. Be blessed. Have a good day.